Good evening to everyone who's here tonight with us at the library and to those watching at home. I understand we have a pretty big crowd. I'm Sandy Landman from the Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission. Welcome to tonight's Option Green program presented by the Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission in partnership with the East Brunswick Public Library. And I'd like to thank Melissa, who you can't see is off camera, Melissa Hosick of the library, who uh, gives us technical support and also program support for this, uh, for this series. The Friends EBEC, as we call it for short, is a nonprofit organization focused on conservation and education. In addition to this lecture series, our projects include some things that you may have heard of if you're uh, in East Brunswick, the community garden, which is located just outside near the municipal building, the salamander protection program. If you've never watched salamanders cross the road on a rainy late winter night, you're, you don't know what you're missing, it's fabulous. Uh, we also sponsor free cycling days. That's our most popular program. Unfortunately, we had to cancel this falls, but we'll be back in the spring. So look for our announcements. We also uh, coordinate and are, the, and are the founder of National Moth Week, my favorite program, which was started right here in East Brunswick by the Friends in 2012. It is an international citizen science project and we have had participation of thousands of people in over 120 countries since then. So we're very proud of that. We also work with the Audubon Society on their, uh, their bird and butterfly camps. I think they're once or twice a year. Uh, we don't charge for any of our programs. We welcome donations. Uh, we also welcome volunteers. We really need volunteers. So um, please go to our website, friends, ebec.com and sign up for our mailing list if you're not already on it. We don't sell your names. We don't bombard you with ads. What we do is we tell you what we're doing and uh, give you a chance to, to come to our programs. So tonight, we're delighted to, to co-sponsor this program on invasive plants with the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. Our speaker, Dr. Hubert Ling is a former president and current member of the board of the Native Plant Society, and he's also its horticulture chair, and I understand he's a botanist. Uh, he uh, holds a PhD in biology from Wayne State University and degrees from Brown University and Queens College. He was an associate professor of biology for over 25 years at the County College of Morris and an associate professor at the University of Delaware. And I promise you that after you hear from Dr. Ling, you will look at the trees and flowers and the weeds growing around us very differently. So there will be some time for questions. And if you're in the room here, we have some wonderful literature that you'll be able to pick up. If you're not, a lot of this information, most of it is on the website and Dr. Ling will show you that later. Uh, and I think, as I said, there'll be time for questions. If you're at home, please put your questions in the chat. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ling. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here and uh, present, oops, <laughs> um, our talk on um, native plants and um, compare them to the invasive plants. So let's see what happens here. Okay. Hmm. Alrighty. Okay. Now let's see. Yeah, I'll accept that. Yeah, that. All right. Well, what we're trying to do is make the world a little bit better. I guess that's our general goal as people. And uh, we're going to be specializing on encouraging native plants and discouraging the invasive plants. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Um, what not to grow? Well, obviously, we don't want to grow the invasive plants. Uh, they're a $138 billion problem. Uh, that's one estimate anyway for the U.S. Uh, every year. We lose quite a bit of money uh, with the invasive plants. Uh, and we'll show you what kind of problems they, they, um, they produce for us. 
Okay, this is my uh, list of my favorite enemies, uh, 10, and you probably have your own. So, uh, and I couldn't include them all because there are about 1,000, 2,000 of them. So I will not talk about all 2,000. Um, <coughs> I think I have about 16 or 17, and that's about it. So uh, we'll try to go kind of fast over some of them. Uh, so here they are here, and uh, uh, my favorite uh, enemy is uh, Japanese stillgrass. As you can see, it, it grows very well. Uh, the invasive plants really do a lot better than many of our um, native plants. And the reason for that, we think, is because they don't have uh, as many enemies. They may have no enemies here. Uh, they don't have viral enemies. They don't have fungal enemies. They don't have insect enemies. The uh, deer don't like it. And so they do really well. Uh, we think that Japanese silkgrass got here about 1919 in packing material. It's kind of spongy and it's cheap and it grows all over the place. So uh, that would be uh, quite a, a possibility from China and Japan too, I guess. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, uh, my grandmother used to grow this. She's very proud of it. And then it went all over the world. Uh, it, it was in the horticultural trade by uh, 1806 or so. So uh, it's a nice plant. It smells very beautiful and uh, grows like crazy. And um, so it is all over New Jersey. So if you walk almost anywhere in New Jersey, you will see Japanese honeysuckle, especially in the sun and in semi um, uh, sunny areas, semi-shade areas. Okay, another one we have here is Multiflora Rose. It's also part of the horticultural trade. Came in in the 1700s, we believe. Uh, it was promoted for all sorts of things. It smells nice, has pretty flowers. Uh, it was used as a crash barrier. The roots are really good. If you ro raise roses, the roots of the Multiflora Rose are some of the best roots you can grow. They're very hardy, they last forever, and uh, if you uh, uh, attach your uh, favorite uh, American rose to the uh, multiflora rose roots uh, grafted on, um, they will uh, do really well. So uh, those are some of the hardiest plants you can grow. And uh, okay, now here's another one. Also in the horticultural trade, the Bradford or Calorie Pear was introduced about 19, uh, 1908 uh, originally. And then in 1965, our USDA promoted this. Uh, the Glendale uh, branch in uh, Maryland, they produced the perfect tree. It's pretty, has a nice shape, it grows like crazy, and it was sterile originally. And uh, so it's a perfect tree. You didn't have to worry about it. Well, it didn't stay sterile very long. And there you have it. It's growing all over the place here. These are all little baby pear trees. In fact, if you go under almost any power line, any field, uh, what you see in spring is white and it's all uh, Bradford pear. I started uh, mating with other strains and uh, they're all fertile now. So does really well. Uh, common reed, Phragmites. Uh, we're not sure where it came from. Um, it came from Europe. I mean, we're not sure when it came. Uh, it came about 1880s or so. It may have been brought in the horticultural trade. It may be used for agricultural purposes. It's edible. It's great for packing. It's all, it's all good for all sorts of stuff. And um, it's uh, edible, so uh, maybe we should eat it. There's a lot of it. Oh, you can make pens and everything out of it. It's uh, roofing. It's good for roofing and uh, if you want to do that kind of thing. This is the American uh, variety of uh, Phragmites. Um, and I've never seen it. I don't think very many of you have probably seen this either. Um, it looks kind of like one of the grasses, um, Miscanthus grass, the, the uh, Asian grass. Um, and I've never seen it growing. I've only seen the nice bushy Phragmites. This is from uh, Hervé. 
Uh, the lesser celandine. I, what? Okay. East Brunswick. Okay, this is uh, this is around the corner from here. <laughs> so um, this really does really well. You can see it grows really well. And it's pretty, it's yellow, and it's bright and cheery in spring, and people have been growing it. And, um, but it just keeps growing and it takes over and there's no room for anybody else. So this is crowding out Jack in the Pulpit, Spring Beauty, um, uh, Erythronium, um, Trout Lily, and almost anything else that grows in damp areas. So uh, as you can see, there's not much room for anything else except lesser salandine. Yeah, there's a little piece of, some, some things make it, but uh, not an awful lot. <laughs> so you lose 90% or 90, 99%, whatever, 98. Okay, here's Japanese uh, barberry, which is still available. It's available in 1864 uh, and is still available. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the bill in uh, New Jersey. Um, uh, we're trying to pass laws against invasive plants in New Jersey, and it may be a reality. We did one thing, I think, uh, last year. We uh, uh, stopped using the uh, nicotinamides for um, spray, uh, nic nicotinoids. So um, that was really toxic for the bees. So um, we're, there's a lot of places where you can still use it, but in general, it's uh, restricted in, um, in home lawns and so forth. Uh, there's some commercial uses for it still, and we're hopefully it, uh, the amount that's used is going way down. Okay, here's purple loosestrife, which is also a pretty plant. The uh, pictures aren't very pretty because uh, I, don't, I don't have very many pictures of invasive plants. I've been avoiding them like the plague. So <laughs> they look kind of ugly and they're not in focus, but um, so I had to borrow everybody else's pictures on invasive plants and go to the internet and everything else. But uh, here's my bad picture of the uh, purple loose drive. Uh, I apparently came in in the ship's ballast and other places for packing maybe, that kind of thing. Okay, now Japanese knotweed, which I don't have any pretty, uh, it produces nice pretty canes, uh, purple stripes on it. And uh, it was introduced in 1850 in the horticultural trade. You can see sort of a, a recurring theme here. This is what we did to ourselves. We did ourselves in. And we are continuing to do ourselves in. There are a whole bunch of plants that are available in nurseries that are potentially invasive are, in, are invasive already, and we know they're invasive, and we're trying to stop the sell of, sale of those. Um, so the uh, continuing to do the same thing that's damaging is the definition for insanity, uh, and we're very close to that. Um, I'm a nurse too, so uh, expecting a different outcome and doing the same wrong thing over and over again is not smart. Uh, Norway maple came over in the 1700s. It's been around for a long time. And uh, it's a pretty tree. It's very hardy and uh, comes in all different shades. And uh, there are purple varieties and red varieties that are uh, red all the time. And there are standard green varieties. And um, it takes over. And uh, all you have is Norway maple on the uh, forest floor. Okay, and after I stopped with 10, I said, well, that's not enough. There's a lot of other plants. <laughs> so I added a few more. I added another seven or so, uh, garlic mustard, uh, English ivy, and so forth. Uh, here's the garlic mustard in our back, my backyard. I actually got rid of it. Uh, it's also edible. All the, almost all the mustards are edible. Um, in fact, I think all of them can be eaten. And um, some of them taste okay, actually. And English ivy is now going uh, wild all over. And uh, once it gets into your yard, it is very difficult to get out. Uh, it's a vine, it creeps down below, it sends roots in. You can pull it up and it just keeps going because it's rooted itself everywhere. And uh, the birds carry it around. And so uh, it's really going 
to town. Uh, Asian bittersweet came over in the 1860s at least uh, into the horticultural trade. As you can see, it's going all over the place here. This is another one from Hervé. Uh, East Brunswick also. Okay, nearby. Uh, and I've never seen this one. This is the American bittersweet. I haven't seen it. It's been just about wiped out. Uh, this is what we used to have. The uh, fruits are on the end. If you look at the uh, uh, Asian bittersweet, the fruits run up and down the, uh, the stalk and, it, and not just at the end. Okay, here they are just on the end. Okay, I've never seen that. Here's autumn olive and then there's Russian olive also. This is the autumn olive with the um, pink uh, reddish fruits. The Russian olive has the uh, silvery fruits, dry fruits. And uh, this was started for the horticultural trade. It's also used for wildlife food and that kind of thing. And now it's all over the place. Butterfly bush has just been taking off recently. It's a very pretty plant also. Uh, the butterflies love it, but not one single North American butterfly is sustained by butterfly bush. They like the nectar, but there is not one single butterfly that can use it for its life cycle. Uh, the uh, larvae can't stand butterfly bush. <laughs> They'll take the nectar, but they can't tolerate the toxins in the leaves. So it's completely uh, a, a wash up as a um, butterfly plant. And we'll tell you what you can do. So here's kudzu we saw in North Carolina, one of our pictures, and uh, it's a bean. You can see the uh, bean leaf over here. Typical bean, like your pole bean, three uh, leaflets. Uh, typical bean flower, although it's a nice, pretty bean flower. Uh, and it's, uh, they're fairly good size, and there's lots of them together. And as you can see, it can go up trees and go all over the place. And uh, we talked to some of the rangers down there in North Carolina. They say, well, it's not exactly the tree that ate the whole South. It only ate part of the South. Uh, it eats the, on the side of the highways, it looks bad because it's all over all the trees. But as you get into the shade, it, does, it starts uh, getting damped out because it doesn't like the shade. So uh, it's not eating the whole South. <laughs> and it's edible too. It was uh, introduced as uh, a horticultural plant, erosion plant, but it's also used as a fodder for animals. And it's nutritious because it's a legume, so it has the uh, nitrogen fixing nodules. I want to add to the comments. Where okay. You just mentioned tree of heaven, which everyone's been talking about. Oh yeah, I didn't put that in. I'm, I'm sorry, I left I'm out your favorite. I'm to add it to the. Yeah, you can add notable, that to the list. Notable problems. Lately. That should be added to the list because it's the favorite of the lanternfly and so forth. And it smells terrible too. <laughs> okay, and there's uh, there's uh, bamboo wisteria. Uh, there's the Asian wisteria. And I wouldn't even grow the southern wisteria because we don't have any wisteria in uh, New Jersey as a native plant. It's further south. But um, some people suggest using the uh, native wisteria. Uh, most of your ornamental grasses that they're growing all over the place now are uh, Asian. And uh, very few of them uh, are the, the native plants. And there are so uh, those are going all over too. They are starting to take off right now as we speak, and you'll see them spotting. I've seen them on the highway. Uh, every once in a while, you have some of the Asian grasses coming in. And once they get going, they're probably going to go all over the place. And the bamboo, once it starts fruiting, seeding, it's, and it only seeds every uh, 30 to 70 years. So we, we haven't seen seeding, I think, a bamboo in New Jersey yet. I haven't heard of any yet. But once it starts seeding, it'll just explode. And there's a, a thousand or maybe 2,000 other invasive plants we should be avoid it, avoiding. Uh, and the Native Plant Society, we suggest that you don't grow anything but native plants. <laughs> and that way you won't grow any invasives. A lot of the native plants are pretty aggressive anyway already, so uh, you have to watch out for some of them if you have a small garden and you don't want to keep pulling them up all the time. Yeah? Uh, I'm wondering if you 
on a um, like a made of bar of Shenandoah grass that we made of grass with a cultivar? Is it harmful? Um, I think the studies on the cultivars usually say that the, um, the some of the cultivars are almost similar to the native uh, spe the, uh, the straight species, um, and some of them um, are not as good. Um, the The reason we have the cultivars is because they they have something unique: the color, the shape, and the um, the uh, arrangement of the fruit or something it's very bushy and so forth that's why people uh, love the cultivars so um uh, and i raise a few non-native plants not too many but um uh having a couple of those are uh is, is okay you don't have to throw out all your cultivars and all your non-native plants but if you don't have enough native plants you can't support the bird population it will not be able to nest and feed its young on your property. And uh, then you reduce the population of uh, insects and, and so forth. And we'll talk about all the insect uh, reduction. So it's better to try to grow the straight species. But if you put a couple of your favorite other plants in, I think we'll probably survive anyway. Okay, so what can we do? Uh, well, don't buy any of the invasives. Don't sell them, don't plant them. Uh, there is a bill in committee, uh, S-2186 uh, is still in committee, and uh, this will limit the sale of invasive plants. Uh, and so we have to decide which invasive plants, like the barberry, uh, purple loose strife would be another example. Um, maybe um, we can um, put some of the other ones in, like Norway maple and, and things. We're not quite sure, we'll probably have to negotiate every single species, but we'd like to put the bill out there and then add to it later as a possibility. To get rid of your invasives, you can dig them out, you can cut them, you can burn, you can use herbicides. Now, some people don't like to use herbicides because it's toxic and it kills other their side effects. Um, the side effects for burning too, it gets out of control sometimes. Uh, cutting, there's some problems with cutting because it grows back again. Now, if you're really persistent, you can cut it and the plant can't keep up with you. If you have one tree of heaven and you keep cutting it, you will kill it. No doubt about it. You can cut faster than it can grow. But if you have an acre of uh, tree of heaven and you keep cutting it, it may be able to grow faster than you can cut. So uh, it depends how many you have and how persistent you are. Uh, I have some bamboo that I planted by accident, sort of. <laughs> I thought since I'm Asian, I was allowed to grow bamboo. Then it went all over the place. And I said, oh, this is not good. And then for the president of the Native Plant Society to be growing bamboo is probably not a good idea either. So I said, I'll cut it down. And I did, and it took about five or six cuttings to get rid of it, but it did, uh, and I had one sprout this year, and I had three or four sprouts last year, but you can get rid of it. It's just, you have to be persistent. Uh, it was not easy. <laughs> okay, um, so there are problems with everything, but uh, it can be controlled if you have a small area and you have a lot of people working on it, you can control uh, anything. Uh, biological control would be easier over a large area. We're still developing this, and there are some problems with that also. Um, the biological control agents can be insects, fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, mites, and I suppose other things also. Um, and we'll talk about some of the ones that are available now, not too many. Our hope is that a biological control agent will be harmless to the desired organisms and people, it would be nice if it doesn't kill us. Uh, the viruses can, they can mutate and they can do all sorts of things. Just because it's really um, nasty to a plant does not mean that it can't grow on people. Um, there are some uh, fungi you know, like corn smut, which normally would not grow on a person, but every once in a while it will attack a person who's been on steroids and has a reduced immune system. So uh, things can happen and uh, they can change. They can mutate very quickly and um, 
we could be in trouble. We could uh, do ourselves in uh, or uh, damage ourselves. Uh, a biological control agent is a very strong power and it keeps on going. So we would like a biological control agent to remain viable and uh, be at a certain low level all the time. And as soon as the invasive plant comes in, and then it will attack it and wipe it out again. Uh, so it would be available to suppress future populations of the same weed with one application, which would be kind of nice. You put it on for $200 and it's good forever, uh, hopefully. Okay, uh, most of these biological control agents that are currently available have not been applied to uh, environmental problems. They're applied to commercial problems for field crops and so forth, as we'll show you, uh, but not to uh, some of the things such as uh, um, uh, the uh, reed, common reed, uh, bittersweet, and that kind of thing. Um, okay, here's uh, an example of uh, what the USDA has been doing. Uh, here's their review article on uh, one plant, spotted knapweed. Okay, and uh, there are two agents here uh, that are, the green means that these are agents are commercially available right now. And there are two insects here. The uh, yellow mean that these are still being studied and some of the orange here, I believe, are the ones that are being proposed as control agents. So you can see we've got a lot of things um, that could potentially control spotted knapweed. Uh, which is a pest of commercial plants. It's a pretty plant, actually. Uh, and uh, here is the multiflora rose uh, disease, uh, rose rosette disease. Uh, it's a virus. And here it is uh, attacking the plant. You can see the plant is suffering. When they turn red, they're not happy. And um, it's all curled up. And this will really suppress, I've seen suppression about 50, 75% of the plant really all curled up like this. Um, that's one plant and a couple plants in a row. But um, this is coming along. It seems to uh, be a lot more common than it used to be. I'd see it occasionally a couple of years ago. And uh, last couple of years, it's been in um, uh, five or 10% maybe of the plants as you walk by have the uh, disease. Okay, this disease is passed along by a uh, mite. Here's the mite over here. And the mite carries the, the, uh, the virus around when it bites and it releases the virus into the systemic system of the um, rose plant. Uh, some people suggest that the Earth's immune system is kicking in. The Earth's immune system is probably, it's been suggested that viruses are part of the Earth's immune system like the uh, COVID-19 virus, getting rid of those pesky humans, <laughs> which is a possibility. So uh, this is kicking in and, and getting rid of the pesky multiflora rose. Unfortunately, this will also hit your, uh, your cultivated roses. So uh, you may <laughs> lose a lot of roses with this, and this may just be happening uh, naturally because um, multiflora rose is all over. And then, you know, you'd have to get rid of all the multiflora rose before you can get rid of the virus disease. And then, so this will be spreading from your uh, multiflora rose in the wild to your cultivated roses. And I don't know if there's any way you could stop that. Uh, maybe you can immunize your rose plants somehow or other. Okay, so these are available. And I put two down here because they are in part of the, uh, the invasive plants that I listed. Um, you can buy these. Uh, this is a price list from 2022. I couldn't get the, the current price list, but uh, the prices have been going up all the time. So for $150, you get 105 of these defoliating beevil, beetles. They may be pretty small, so you get a little tiny test tube of beetles for $150, and you're sort of wondering what you paid for there. And then you release them, shake them out on your uh, purple loose strife, and hopefully they grow all over the place and they kill all the purple loose strife. 
Um, so uh, they tell you when to re release it, uh, May and June. And here's another one for purple knapweed, uh, for um, uh, knapweed. And uh, it's, uh, you get 105 of those also for $150. It's $1 each for these little tiny beetles. <laughs> And uh, these bore into the roots. There are weevils that uh, bore into the roots, and you release them in July through September. Okay, there are also um, agents for uh, common mullein uh, poison hemlock, which is growing all over New Jersey now, and it's really toxic, so you got to watch out for that. It looks kind of like uh, Queen Anne's lace, and um, it's, uh, that's what Socrates took, so uh, you probably don't want to take it voluntarily anyway. And so watch out for that. That's pretty nasty stuff. So you might want to find out what poison hemlock looks like and avoid it. Uh, it's in some of the parks all over the place. Uh, and toad flax and thistle can be uh, controlled by uh, biological agents. Okay, so here is the uh, purple loose strife, and here's the defoliating uh, beetle. And here's the uh, spotted knapweed and the root boring weevil looks like that. Cute little guy. Okay, also we have uh, fungi. You can control weeds that you don't want by uh, using certain types of fungi. And these are available commercially too. I didn't get the prices on these, but here are the trade names here. They're available now. And uh, you can control the weeds on your rice and soybeans, cotton, corn, wheat, citrus, soybeans, cranberry, and rice. Um, now, interestingly enough, these uh, fungi here are controlling native plants. So <laughs> we're getting rid of native plants by using a commercial fungus uh, agent. And here's partridge pea, which is also a, a native plant. Uh, dotter and nut sedge, which are all native. Uh, so we're killing off the good guys, maybe. Uh, according to the farmers, obviously, these are not the good guys. They uh, compete with the, uh, the crop plants. So a uh, weed is anything you don't want, even if it's native. Okay, so what's the problem we have in, in conservation? Uh, we're losing diversity from lots of different uh, reasons. Uh, one of the worst is the bluefin tuna. We're down about 98%, almost 99%. These are all gone. They are wonderful tasting for people who like uh, sushi. And uh, the last one I heard was $2 million for one fish delivered to <laughs> Japan. And um, they may be more now. That was a couple years ago. So uh, that's why there aren't too many bluefin tuna anymore. Uh, monarch butterflies were down 96%. That was the worst year. They're up up now, actually. But the, the worst year, they were down 96%. And we thought we might lose all the monarch butterflies. But uh, they're up, I think, to 20 or 30% now of the uh, 1960 level. Uh, the ocean fisheries are down about 75%, either lost or depleted. Uh, snowy owl is down. Bobolinks are down. Uh, New Jersey is listing... 40% of its plants as rare and endangered. That's uh, over 800 of them. And it's the same for the new, uh, new uh, addition to, uh, I didn't bother counting them all, but it looks almost the same. It hasn't changed that much. And uh, the North American bird population is down about 29% or so uh, from 1970. So uh, plants are going extinct, animals are going extinct, uh, and um, we are running into problems here. Okay, why are the native plants important? Native plants are important because many of the animals rely entirely on the native plants. In fact, for one plant, we presume that about 10 animals are relying on that for survival. So you remove that one plant, if it goes extinct, or is extirpated, which is removed from the state, uh, you lose 10 animals. And we've lost about 50 plants in New Jersey uh, as far as our records show already, so we've lost 500 animals. Um, okay, what you lose are the insects, birds, mammals, and maybe we're gonna start losing people too. 
Uh, that could happen. In fact, eventually it will happen if you uh, start losing enough plants. Okay, we'll be losing the uh, living component and after a while we'll lose everything else. So the living component and the physical component go together to make up New Jersey. And we really can't lose the living component or we don't really have New Jersey as it is now. Uh, Doug Tallamy is the, one of the first people to actually get data on what we're, what's happening out there. Uh, we've all been worrying about it, but he actually published real data. And he says about 96% of the North American uh, terrestrial birds that leaving, leaving, leaving out the waterfowl rely on insects to raise their young. Yeah. These are even the vegetarian birds, which just eat nuts and, and seeds and so forth. Uh, but their young need high protein food. And I suggest this for people too. I would not suggest feeding your babies uh, a vegetarian diet. It's, just, it's, it's really difficult to give them a, a good diet uh, vegetarian. You should probably raise them on uh, caterpillars. <laughs> <laughs> they do a lot better. So uh, here's a uh, example of what's happening to the bird population. We don't have studies all over, but this was a nice study that I found. Uh, this links the uh, loss of insects to the loss of three birds. You can see the starlings are doing the best. They're pretty tough. So uh, Lynette, in case you don't know it, is a small finch. I didn't know what it was. Sky Skylarks, you probably know. They they're, uh, they sound very nice, and they're high flying and so forth. Okay, so uh, using 1976 as the base of 100% for the insect population, and then going down to 2016 with 27% of the English, uh, the insect population, we have lost 70% of the insects in this uh, area of Denmark. Okay, so what does 70% loss of the insects do? Well, the birds eat the insects. So there they are. The linnets are down about the same as the um, insects. The skylarks are doing a little better. They eat something else maybe besides insects, or maybe they're just efficient at collecting insects. And the starlings we know eat everything. So uh, they're doing uh, a little bit better. But you can see uh, if this is one-to-one -one correlation, which it apparently is, because the, um, these birds are eating a lot of insects, um, it's reasonable to assume that this is what's happening. We're losing the bird population because we've lost the insect population. And most of you that are a little older remember driving in the summer, and what we used to have to do is stop every once in a while and rewash the windows because you couldn't see out of them anymore. You had all these sticky bugs all over and you'd scrape and scrape the windows and so you could go again because you'd fly through a swarm of insects. I haven't seen a swarm of insects in years. Um, every once in a while a bug hits it, oh, there's a bug, but um, it does not cover the windshield. And uh, they've been doing windshield tests in Germany and they can, quantify the fact that the windshields are a lot cleaner now than they used to be. There aren't any bug, uh, aren't as many bugs around. They've gone all the way down. I mean, they, they could be down 70%. So that's uh, kind of disturbing. Okay, so the study by Doug Ptolemy here is on um, Lepidoptera, which are butterflies, moths, and skippers. They're separate. And uh, here's their favorite tree, the oak tree, which supports a lot of different kind of lepidopteran. And then maple is number seven. So obviously there's a, a whole list that he has, I think that go up to about 50 different plants. And I just have the first 18, um, or five of the first 18. Okay, so uh, these are very popular plants and we go all the way down to pear, like Bradford pear, which is number 18. It's the 18th most um, popular plant uh, of the Lepidopterans. And uh, based on this really rough schedule and calculating the way I did it, the native plants are 73 times as effective at raising 
butterflies and such than the um, alien plants. So if we got rid of all the native plants, so we would not have very many butterflies left. Okay, and you can calculate it different ways. You can come out with a different number. Okay, another problem we pretty well uh, aware of, and most of you have heard of it in the newspapers, is the bee problem. The uh, honeybees uh, uh, pollinate a lot of our crops, commercial crops, and the hives are transported from um, farmer to farmer, depending on when the plants are flowering. Uh, honeybees do not do all the pollination. They do some of the pollination. A lot of the pollination is done, most of the pollination is done by our native bees. But uh, honeybees are used a lot for various crops like almonds and peaches and uh, um, apples and so forth. And they ensure that the, we get a good crop. Okay, you can see what's happening with the, the honeybee colonies are lost uh, every year, uh, starting in 2011 to 2012, we lost 37% of the beehives in that one year. Um, some of the beekeepers say that if they lose 30% of the bees, they're in trouble. If they lose 40% of the colonies, they know they're in trouble and they give up. So uh, many of them have given up. Okay, so you can see the 37%, 40, 44, and now it's the last year was about 48%. A lot of the beekeepers are giving up. Yes? Are honeybees native? No, they are not. They're Italian honeybees. Why, why is it in this discussion? Um, it's just because we don't have studies on our native bees. <laughs> That's why it's there. It's the only data I could find. We have, we have some data on the native bees, but uh, not a lot. A lot. Um, uh, let's see, I, I, I guess I didn't include the bumblebee. There's a little bit of the bumblebee data. Uh, but uh, if you see that the, the bees that we're taking care of are dying, the bees that we're not taking care of are also dying. You can assume that, and we, we know they are dying off. Okay, most of the plants need pollinators. Um, they, uh, the basic pollinators are bees, but you may not realize that there are a lot of other insects that are pollinators. Um, the flies, the beetles, the butterflies, the moths, the ants, the wasps, and there are a few higher animals and snails and things like that occasionally pollinate. Uh, but the birds, especially the hummingbirds and the bats are also pollinators of uh, uh, plants. Uh, there are two basic kinds of crops that we have, uh, the grains and others. And grains are um, about 70% of the crops that are grown in the United States are grains. And uh, about 30% are is everything else. Uh, everything else is uh, fruits, nuts, veggies, fodder, and oil seed, which I sort of had to think a little bit. And that's like canola and sunflower uh, producing our uh, cooking oil. The uh, grains are wind pollinated, so you don't have to worry about pollinators there. But everything else, the other 30% are um, insect pollinated. So fruits, nuts, and veggies, and so forth would disappear, uh, are, are disappearing, are becoming more difficult uh, as we're losing our bee population. Both the um, Italian uh, bees, um, commercial bees, and the native bees. So we're losing both at the same time. And so it's a double whammy. And uh, if it goes down too much further, we may not be able to raise some of these crops. So we could lose people too. Okay, let's see. Okay, here's some of the general bee, populate, uh, bee uh, studies, uh, which are a little bit rougher, but uh, about 90% of the native plants need uh, insects for pollinating. Uh, we have about um, 1,500 or so native bees. 23% uh, of them are stable. They're, the population is not declining or increasing. 52% um, are declining and 24% uh, are endangered. We've lost several bumblebees here and there. 
We don't have good year-to-year -year studies on these bees, but uh, there um, we have a, a little bit of data. Uh, and I couldn't put this picture in because I asked for permission and I never got permission, but uh, I had a nice picture of a farmer up in a tree, hand pollinating his pear tree with a, a look like a sunflower or something on a stick and he was going and they could do three trees a day. And uh, the reason that they're hand pollinating them is because the beekeepers will not let their bees go to the uh, pear uh, orchards because there's too much uh, insecticide used and they'll lose all their bees. So one person has to work, can do three pear trees a day instead of just letting the bees do it by themselves. So it's a lot more work and it's kind of dangerous. You're up in a little tiny tree pollinating every single flower, which is awfully tedious. They've been doing that since the year 2000, the last 23 years or so, they've been hand pollinating their trees. So it's kind of bad. Okay, what can you do? Uh, well, you can support a society like the New Jersey Native Plant Society, uh, Xerces, um, uh, the um, Invasive Species Strike Team, uh, New Jersey Conservation, and there's a whole bunch of other groups uh, to um, you can support. Uh, here's the Native Plant Society. We have speakers and seminars such as this one, field trips. Um, we have seed exchanges. Uh, we give grants out to uh, native gardens, although we haven't done it too recently, but uh, hopefully they will start that up again um, and uh, support some research and development. Uh, we have um, native plant lists and we have invasive plant lists. Our mission, uh, as we have over there, is the Appreciation Protection Study of New Jersey Native Flora. Okay, and we have a sister website, which uh, Millie is the uh, webmaster for, and I help out in that. Uh, and that is uh, Awesome Native Plants. And you will get directed there for, from the Native Plant Society too. So you can go to the Native Plant Society and look at some of the plant resources and the pictures will refer you over to the, uh, this uh, Awesome Native Plant site, site. Oh, look out, it's info and not uh, org or something. Okay, so uh, native bees uh, apparently do a lot more work and uh, this doctor from Cornell thinks that they're two or three times better than honeybees for uh, pollinating plants. Um, I don't know where he got his data from, but we sort of take his word for it. Uh, here's the Xerces Society. I, I did a mock-up of their logo because I don't have permission to use their logo either. <laughs> and uh, their invertebrate uh, conservation they have a nice little guide for the pollinator plants of the mid-Atlantic region. And we have uh, those also uh, on our website. Um, and it includes such things as red maple, milkweed, red bud, and so forth. You, so you can take a look for that. It's a little harder to find. Now you have to go all the way through their site and keep pushing all the buttons. And eventually you'll get to this uh, pollinator plants for the mid-Atlantic region. It wasn't easy. Um, the invasive uh, New Jersey Invasive uh, Species Strike Team has uh, teamed up with the uh, Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space, and they do various uh, programs. Uh, Mike Van Cleff is the stewardship director, and you sort of contact him if you want, if you find uh, an invasive plant like uh, another site for kudzu or so. Um, they worked on uh, Morristown Historical uh, Park uh, on Burning Bush and Privet. They went to Princeton and. And they were working on the Yakuza dogwood, which is now going invasive. Uh, they were working on some kudzu sites. And uh, recently, he's, they found 20 new kudzu sites in New Jersey. They're hoping to get rid of all 20 of them. Uh, uh, Mike Van Cleft thinks it'll cost about $70,000. We haven't contacted him to see how it's going, but uh, he's trying to remove the 20 new kudzu sites so we don't turn into the uh, plant that uh, chewed up New Jersey also, uh, but it seems to be doing pretty well here. Nice and healthy. New Jersey Conservation Foundation uh, preserves land. Uh, they're working on clean energy, reducing uh, off-road vehicle damage in Wharton State Forest. The uh, off-road uh, off vehicles 
do wheelies in the sand and they wipe out a lot of the orchids. They, they like the marshy areas and that's where you do your best wheelies, I guess. So uh, we saw some very close to some of the uh, rare orchids that were out there and they're working on farm conservation too. Okay, so you can grow natives instead of invasives. Uh, if you have a small garden, this works pretty well. Um, the state is also planting occasionally, at least along the highways, uh, they will be planting natives. And uh, another great idea from Doug Ptolemy, University of Delaware, where I used to work, uh, is uh, the Homegrown National Park. Uh, they have a, their own website. Uh, and Doug said the national parks um, all together are about uh, 50 million acres and the U.S. yards all put together are about 50 million acres. So we could double the acreage of the national parks if everybody were to grow native plants uh, in their yard. Um, to make this a little bit more palatable for your neighbors, you can always put a little strip of grass around your yard so you make it look intentional. <laughs> put little fences around your uh, native plants and make a little pads in between them. And um, uh, you, the native plants can look beautiful and um, many people won't know that they're native plants. They're, uh, they're quite pretty. Um, they do not do as well as some of the invasive plants. So I'll show you some of these suggestions and they really are, do not grow as well as lesser celandine. Uh, in fact, some of them are kind of hard to grow, but uh, unless the selenine is kind of hard to stop. So here's some other native plants. It's a little bouquet. Okay, native plants will support the native insects. As we said, they use less water. You don't have to water them. You don't have to fertilize them. They're adapted to New Jersey. Uh, they reduce runoff. Uh, lawns do not do that well preserving the groundwater. Uh, the native plants are probably three to five times better at uh, ground infiltration uh, of water, rainwater, than, the, uh, than grasses are. So grasses, if you look at your lawns after a rain, the penetration is only usually uh, two or three inches after the average rainfall, which is half an inch to an inch or so. That's a good rain. And it only goes down about an inch. Uh, native plants, it'll go down about eight inches, 10 inches or, or more. And so they pick up a lot more water. Uh, your lawns just shed the rest of the water and it just goes right off. Um, so you'll reduce the runoff by quite a bit if you have a native uh, yard instead of uh, just a lawn. Uh, your native, native plants are unique. Nobody else is growing them hardly. Uh, so you can be the only one in your block to be growing um, swamp pink or something. Uh, they're generally perennial ecologically balanced. Most of them are not uh, invasive, although some of them are pretty, I would not suggest growing. Uh, and we, I think we should, uh, I don't know if we have a list, but we ought to have a list of native plants you should not grow. Uh, there are quite a few. Uh, you don't want to grow Canadian goldenrod. Uh, thistles, you probably don't want to grow, although some people may. Uh, you don't want to grow a money wort because you can't get rid of the thing. It grows on your lawn and you pull it up and it's got roots all over the place. So I wouldn't grow money wort. Don't grow um, uh, horsetail in a damp yard. It just goes all over the place. And um, there's a couple other things. I think we should have a list of um, oh, a Canadian uh, anemone grows all over the place. Uh, in your yard, you try putting it in the woods and it just stops, which uh, so that's where I'm putting all my Canadian anemone. I've got, uh, if you want a couple thousand plants of Canadian anemone, come over to my yard and help yourself. Been trying, to, I made the offer for years. Nobody's ever taken me up on it. It's a pretty plant, but uh, you really don't want it probably. Okay, so what could you grow? You could grow a uh, little blue stem, which is a pretty, very pretty plant instead of the Japanese still grass. You can grow Japanese honey, uh, coral honeysuckle instead of a Japanese honeysuckle. Okay, here's a little blue stem. Uh, it's a pretty plant, especially in fall. It's got all these reddish like uh, uh, seeds growing on it. Um, 
it does not grow as well as Japanese stilt grass. <laughs> You've got to baby this along a little. Japanese stilt grass, you don't have to do anything. It grows all by itself. Uh, coral honeysuckle is pretty tough, and it would probably replace Japanese honeysuckle if you gave it a chance. So you could get it going, and it's pretty bushy and pretty, uh, um, it would uh, probably uh, wipe out the Japanese honeysuckle or keep it down. And it's a very pretty plant. And what else is good about coral honeysuckle? Yep. Anybody have any suggestions? Hummingbirds. The hummingbirds love it. Yes, they will. If you get a, a big batch of coral honeysuckle, the hummingbirds will visit you on the way up to uh, New England and the way down from New England. They'll they'll be back again in the fall. And um, oh well, if you need something else, usually coral honeysuckle doesn't bloom that well. It does bloom for a fairly long time, but you get only a couple flowers in the fall. So uh, you better switch to uh, the. Um, uh, uh, one of the other red plants, uh, cardinal flower in the fall. Okay, so you don't want to grow multiflora rose, although it's very easy to grow, <laughs> or Bradford pear. Okay, so there are other roses. We do have native roses. Uh, you can grow the swamp rose or the pasture rose, and they have pretty flowers. They're harder to grow, and they don't grow as fast. So, uh, but they do, uh, they do produce really nice flowers. And you can grow uh, flowering raspberry if you're in the shade, which has a beautiful flower. And uh, it's much prettier than the West Coast flowering raspberry, which is salmon berry. And uh, ours is nicer. Um, and um, this grows reasonably well. Um, okay, you don't have to grow the uh, Bradford pear, you can grow Flowering dogwood, of course, it does not grow as easily, and it is subject to some diseases, but it's hanging in there. Uh, everybody said the anthracnose when this would attack it, and um, they're doing fine. They have been doing, you can grow a black hob viburnum, which is, has a nice white flower too, uh, and that's pretty tough. It grows in about the same place. So gray dogwood grows all over. This may be one that you might not want to grow. It's a little bit hard to control. So uh, if you've got a good lawnmower, put it in a spot and mow it around the edges and you can sort of hold it down. Uh, elderberry uh, grows for a couple of years and then it kind of moves over to another site or something. It doesn't hang in there too well. It makes beautiful jam though. If you, this is the, the best jam I've ever made is out of elderberry, really very fragrant. Okay, common reed, invasive. You could grow tall meadow rue, so I'd have to replace it in the same place. Um, obviously, it doesn't grow quite as well, but this is fairly uh, uh, aggressive also. It doesn't go all over your yard, but it will jump around a little bit. Uh, silky dogwood would grow in the same area too, and it's pretty, um, it's a pretty tough plant. And, uh, white turtle head uh, will grow but it doesn't spread like uh, some of the other plants like reeds do, obviously. Um, okay, lesser celandine, which forms carpets all over the place, could be replaced by swamp buttercup. Of course, swamp buttercup will not form a carpet. You could grow it all over and pamper it, and maybe you can get some clumps of it, but it won't form a carpet. Uh, marsh marigold won't either, but it is a pretty plant. It'll form little clumps here and there if it's perfectly happy. And if it's not, it'll just die out on you. Uh, yellow star grass uh, usually hangs in there pretty well, but it doesn't uh, cover the area either. But it grows in moist areas. Okay, you don't want to grow Japanese barberry or purple loose drive. You could grow uh, mountain laurel, which is a nice, pretty plant. It has beautiful buds. Little, look, 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 they look like little candies. And uh, spice bush grows pretty easily. And then you can get the spice bush uh, butterfly, which uh, the uh, caterpillar, which is really interesting. I guess I don't have them. Oh, well. Uh, purple loose drive could be uh, replaced with cardinal flower, which uh, grows pretty well. Um, and then the um, uh, hummingbirds love cardinal flowers. And what we do is we grow cardinal flowers right next to our deck, and we put them in. Um, bags of soil, put the cardinal flowers in there. We have it about um, 
five or eight feet away from the window, and then we watch all the hummingbirds come over. And we have pictures of the hummingbirds flying around and bee balm. Uh, as an eye, it's the some of the hybrids and some of the uh, varieties are a little more aggressive than the uh, native plant. They always have trouble growing bee balm. It kind of fades away on me. Um, Great blue lobelia hangs in there a lot better. It's, it's a lot tougher. It's easier to grow. And the butterfly, uh, the hummingbirds will take that if they have nothing else. They love the cardinal flower, but they'll, they will um, nibble on great blue lobelia also when there's nothing else around. Uh, Greek valeria is a nice plant for spring. It grows very easily. It's much easier to grow than uh, the other Jacob's ladders, the commercial ones that you usually get. So this is a little harder to find but the uh, native plant stores have it. Okay, Japanese knotweed, you don't wanna grow. You could grow a strawberry bush. Of course, it's not as aggressive. The deer love it also. So <laughs> <laughs> there's not too much stuff the deer don't love. But um, <clears throat> strawberry bushes, the, uh, the flowers are not very much. They look like that, They're kind of different. But here's the fruit on the strawberry bush. It's really different. And some of the migrating birds just love this. So they'll pick your plants clean. And uh, it's a really funny combination. It's got hot pink and a uh, hot orange at the inside, kind of strange color combination, but uh, some people like it and uh, seems to work pretty well. Uh, Spike nard is a nice one for uh, uh, <clears throat> as a replacement. And uh, the birds love this too. It's in the Jinxon family. It's pretty tall. It gets about uh, five feet, uh, nine feet. Fall. Okay, and you can use um, purple hyssop, which doesn't uh, take over too easily unless conditions are just right. But if you've got just the right conditions, you may be able to keep this going. And then there's the yellow hyssop, giant yellow hyssop too, which is a nice columnar kind of plant. Okay, and you could grow swamp azalea where you can grow um, Japanese knotweed also. Um, it's also not very uh, aggressive, and the deer chew, nibble on it a little bit, they, but they keep nibbling on it all the time. So they don't like it, but they'll nibble on it anyway. <laughs> and the blueberries, of course, they'll nibble on too. Uh, oh, Xerces is, it means that they're uh, approved by Xerces as a um, pollinator plant. Okay, and witch hazel would also grow in a damp area. Okay, you don't have to grow a Norway maple. There are plenty of alternatives to Norway maple. Uh, Norway maple is a really good plant. It doesn't get sick very often. It uh, grows really well. And um, sugar maple doesn't grow as well. It likes it a little bit cooler, but uh, it'll grow. And um, it's got beautiful leaves, better than Norway maple leaves uh, in fall. And I think you can get sugar out of either one. Yeah, it's, it has the, those knotty, those brown things that fall. No, that's uh, sweet gum. Oh, okay. This one, uh, sugar maple has little tiny uh, samaras. Um, okay. They're little, uh, little baby helicopters. The Norway maple's got the big ones that you can stick on your nose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to stick it on your nose, you need a Norway maple. And <laughs> sugar maple is really small. It's not going to stick really, really well. And it makes the Norway maple makes the better helicopters. You throw them up and they all come down. You know. And sugar maple ought to do that also. I, don't, I haven't tried it. <clears throat> but um, OK, uh, you can also use red maple, which is probably the best tree to replace the uh, Norway maple with. It's sort of multi-purpose tree anywhere. And it'll also grow in very damp areas. In fact, it'll grow right in the, in the swamp. It's also called swamp maple sometimes. Uh, another plant that the deer kind of like to chew on is moosewood, uh, which is uh, the, the moosewood, the flowers are running down, and striped maple, the flowers are uh, facing up. But there are two relatively rare maples now in New Jersey because um, the deer kind of love them. So uh, if you have a fenced in yard, they're fine. But if you're out in the, if the deer can graze on them, uh, they probably won't survive. But um, they're an interesting maple and they're small. They're very small maples. 
Okay, garlic, mustard, English ivy you don't want. Uh, garlic mustard can be replaced with a tooth wort. Obviously not quite as aggressive, but uh, they're both mustards. Uh, they're crucifers. And uh, here's the cross here. It's a uh, kind of a, like a Greek cross. Uh, and that's the um, mustards are in the family cruciferi. And uh, so these are it's another mustard kind of plant. And uh, English ivy could be replaced by trumpet vine, clematis, and um, also the uh, uh, native uh, honeysuckle, the uh, trump, uh, the um, coral honeysuckle. Okay, bittersweet, you shouldn't be growing. Uh, you could use uh, clematis, which is a nice uh, native. Um, I don't think it's too aggressive. Um, it does grow pretty well, though. And you can see it all along the road. There is a also a uh, a invasive uh, clematis out there also. So you have to check the uh, the leaves to find out if it's a native one or the uh, invasive one. Okay, and you don't want to grow a Russian olive. You could grow a Juneberry, Amelanchia, which is available commercially all over and has very pretty flowers. And you could eat the fruit. Well, you could eat the Russian olive also. <laughs> But I think the uh, Juneberry tastes better. <laughs> it's sweeter. Uh, butterfly bush, okay, butterfly bush can be replaced <coughs> by butterfly weed, which is a milkweed. And uh, Xerxes proves uh, swamp milkweed is another good one for uh, replacing butterfly weed. And the milkweeds um, will sustain the whole life cycle of uh, several butterflies, only uh, all the um, swallowtail butterflies and uh, several other kinds of butterflies. Okay, bergamot's a good one. And this one is the one I suggest for butterfly kiss. Uh, anybody know what a butterfly kiss is? There was a song, Butterfly Kisses, a while back. Okay, it's usually when you get your grandchildren and you hold them close and they open and close their eyes and their eyelashes will flutter on your cheek or something. That's a butterfly kiss. If you haven't had a butterfly kiss? Well, you people are missing out. And then you can get a real butterfly kiss. And I suggest you use bergamot. So grow about 10 of these, put them in the middle of your yard and um, have a space around it. And uh, you can put a chair there and just sit there, wait for the butterflies to come by. Uh, if you chase a butterfly, it'll run. If you sit there, the butterfly will land right next to you or on top of you. And then you lean forward slowly and the butterfly thinks you're a leaf. If you move slowly, it thinks you're a leaf or, a, uh, you know, a sunflower or something. I guess you're pretty big. But if you move quickly, he thinks you're a bird and then they'll fly. So you have to kind of move slowly and then you stick your nose there and they'll open and close their, their wings on your nose or your cheek or whatever. And you get scales all over, but that's usually okay. And then they fly away because you're pushing too hard on them. But you have to try it. Uh, and bergamot is the, uh, this is the one of the preferable plants to use. Oops, there. So uh, get a whole bunch of those and uh, they really love those. Okay, Culver's root's another good one to replace uh, your invasives with. Uh, it's pretty hardy, it's a very hardy plant. It's a nice tall plant, so I'll put it in the back. Um, it's usually 40 to six feet high and um, it's a mint. So uh, the bees love um, Culver's root. Okay, Penstemon digitalis is a nice plant too. It's a good one for growing in full sun and dry areas. And um, the uh, bees love that also. And it's, it's a very easy plant to grow and it persists. Some of the perennials don't, are not really perennial. They're sort of soft perennials. Uh, cardinal flower is a soft perennial. Many of the mountain mints are all so soft perennials. They'll go for about five to seven years and then they die. And my uh, friend uh, who had the biggest cardinal flower collection I've ever seen, she had a whole 30 feet by 60 feet of cardinal flowers, a lot of cardinal flowers. And then one year she calls me up, uh, this is Dr. Knorr, Betty Knorr was a very great uh, uh, plant propagation person, well, a native plant. She called me up and said, do you have any cardinal flower seeds? I said, 
cardinal flower seeds? You've got the biggest patch of cardinal flowers I've ever seen. She said, well, I used to have the biggest patch of cardinal flowers. They all died. I said, how did that happen? She says, well, she's been cloning them. So she clones them every year. You get like 10 clones out of your cardinal flower. You pick them off and now you have 10 more. And then next year you have 100. And the next year you have 1,000. And uh, so she had a couple thousand plants and they all died at the same time. Like uh, Dolly, the uh, uh, cloned mammal, um, they only go as long as the species go. Dolly's mother was six years old when they were when they cloned her, and she only went six years. That the uh, sheep, the Dorset sheep, usually live twelve years, and Dolly only lived, lived six years. We assume she died early because her uh, telomeres or something got cut off, and. She didn't. So um, you don't want to clone people, probably. They, they might not last too long if we ever do that. Okay, some other plants that we can use for uh, uh, replacement of invasives are pinkster azaleas, which grow pretty nicely. Kind of slow, but uh, they support a lot of swallowtails and things, especially in the early spring. And New England aster supports uh, the pollinators in the fall. And uh, they, they need uh, the monarchs and other uh, butterflies need the uh, asters because they bloom late. And on their way down to Mexico, they need something to eat. So uh, the, butter, uh, the uh, milkweeds may have died off already. So as a last boost, you need some of your asters to keep them, uh, help them survive on their way down on their really big trip. Uh, the purple coneflower is a nice one because it's pretty uh, perennial. It uh, lasts a long time. The other coneflowers don't do too well. They, they die off on you and uh, they're a little harder to grow. This is pretty tough. Uh, sneezeweed is also a fairly tough plant and it's nice and yellow and it uh, grows pretty well by itself. Okay, if you don't want to grow kudzu, you could grow a red butt. It's a, a bean. <laughs> has a similar kind of uh, flower and uh, it grows really easily. I've got them growing all over the place. If you need some red bud, I usually have some little seedlings sitting all over the place. So you've got red bud coming out of our ears. Okay, so what you should be doing, hopefully, is we can talk you into it, grow native plants, not the invasive ones. Uh, grow milkweeds especially. You could try adding a bee house to your garden, which might be interesting. Join a society. Here's the bee house. Uh, they don't cost too much, $14 bee house, or you can make your own. Uh, also for the bees, you might want a, a patch of bare soil. So get yourself a patch of bare soil. Some of the bees like to dig in the bare soil, which is not easy to find because it's usually covered up with uh, Japanese stilt grass. So, uh, <laughs> Get yourself some bare soil and maybe you'll have some bees dig in your bare soil. And uh, here's the uh, Native Plant Society of New Jersey website, uh, npsnj.org. And uh, you can get all sorts of information, the plant lists, uh, activities, how to plant a rain garden. We have uh, uh, instructions, join the society, ask questions. You can ask horticulture, that's me uh, probably and uh, get advice. Uh, you can look at the photo gallery, which switches you over to Awesome Native Plants. Awesome Native Plants info. Okay, so that's all I have there. So before we start questions, anytime someone here asks a question, we're gonna need to repeat it because the people online can't hear. Okay, fine. That. And also, right. I want to lower the volume on that so when I relay questions from online, your ears don't get blown. So, okay. that really quick to make it a more pleasant experience for everyone. Right. Because I will start echoing really badly and I don't want to. Okay. So, do you want to start in the room or online? Start oh. Room? Okay, well, either way. Up to you. So, what? So let me see. We have a bunch of. Com see, now I'm coming through there. Hold on. Where is it? Mm. 
Okay. Don't know why it's doing that. Okay. We're just gonna have to be careful about the book. When I talk about the Trying to get back to the beginning. Let's see. How do you get rid of a mugwort? <laughs> well, <laughs> the way I get rid of everything is just pull it up. Um, it's good exercise. It's good for you. You need to do something anyway. Keep moving. And I don't see why you have to go to the gym to exercise. You can stoop, pull it up, and, uh, you know, you could do it, plan it um, just like a half hour or some 15 minutes as you're running around, run out, do 15 minutes of pulling up weeds, you know, and especially in the bright sunshine, you know, and cheer up and so forth. Um, that's what I do to all the plants. I just, uh, I don't put any chemicals on it usually. I've done it, some chemicals in the past. I feel a little guilty putting Roundup or something on it. And uh, it's not good for you either. So, uh, Speaking of that weeding, um, someone's looking for a Boy Scout Troop Service Hour project. And would it be fair and not torture to have them pull Japanese stilt grass out as their service project? Um, Japanese stilt grass is really easy to pull out. So you should try to get it before it seeds uh, because after it seeds, it's not gonna do much good. So um, yeah, catch it before it seeds. Uh, let's see, what's um, the timing on that? Um, I guess uh, early September is good. Um, if you wait too long, it's going to seed and then you're stuck. And then if you pull it out, what should you replace it with? Oh, uh, well, you could use the, uh, I suggested some of the, uh, the native grasses. We have the uh, little blue stem, big blue stem. Uh, there's Indian grass. And I think there's a couple of uh, purple love glick grass I think you can use. Um, I like some of the other ones, um, but uh, any of the uh, any of the native grasses, they're not terribly popular yet. So uh, I think uh, little blue stem and big blue stem are some of the most popular plants that you can get. Uh, and also someone in the chat mentioned this Shenandoah, and they said it's like a regular switchgrass and it's on a list of not as invasive cultivars and everything. So your mention of the Shenandoah, someone's sending you a thumbs up in the chat. Okay, great. Right, so you can go back to the room. Okay, anybody have questions here? Definitely. I once went to a um, seminar space, uh, you know, about a bamboo. Uh -huh. I'm Chinese with bamboo. Yeah. Bamboo, so but uh, is that really true? So I was just debating. <clears throat> I learned something this. The bamboo is not the considering it is the, the invasive <coughs> because it said, you know, well, obviously I was very happy to hear that. But it's definitely it's said because I went to the like a kind of like seminar like meeting them. And the, uh, well, uh, he was just talking about all of those invasive plants. It's believe or not, you know, the Japanese people is very invasive, but the bamboo is not. So people ask the question, why? And he says, you know, because bamboo is only a, uh, say, they, they never go into the woods. So they always stop on the edge of it. It's not like Japanese maple, he said, uh, grows everywhere, you know, can grow in the shade. So uh, the Japanese the, the maple took over all the places. But bamboo is actually, you know, it's just the state uh, on the edge. Yeah. And they never go that. So what do you think? You know, obviously, you have the bad uh, relationship with your neighbors because that's. But is that true? Yeah. Uh, the Japanese uh, the bamboo is not really that invasive because it didn't go um, into the. Well, it's. I think uh, kudzu doesn't grow in the shade either, but it's taken over uh, a good portion because what we do to the environment is we create a lot of open space. So, uh, and we've got a tremendous amount of uh, street, number of streets running through everything. Uh, our parks are opened up and with the trails and the, uh, <clears throat> the streets and the parking lots, 
So there is a tremendous amount of, yeah, I, I sort of love bamboo too. You know, we have a relationship with bamboo right. and that's why I put it in. <laughs> but it was really difficult to get out. Right, something is the way I ask you question. You mentioned that it seems like it gave us a kind of a hope. Uh, we have the bad problem with the bamboo thing. So the, sometimes I, if I do, I'll just dig it up, you know, you know, mm -hmm. surrounding things, right? Yeah. Uh, some people doesn't like to do the hard work. They say, oh, well, I read something. It's just like, once they have something shooting up, he cut. But mm -hmm. eventually, will that work? You know, if, yeah, if it'll, every shoot comes it'll up, work, but it'll, it may take 10 years. Oh, really? it's, it's very slow, yeah. Uh, to speed it up a little bit, I, I dug the roots out. Digging the right. roots out is really difficult. They're very right. tenacious. Yeah, they're yeah. hard. You have to use an axe to to uh, to break them up, right. and then yeah, they're really tenacious. So uh, uh, it's probably a lot better not to grow them. Maybe right. if you but wanted to grow them, you so could grow them in a pot or something on your deck. No, they're gonna and, even in a pot. They're still gonna run up. Well, um, on your deck. <laughs> So inside <laughs> so if you just keep cutting the uh, things if you keep like cutting it it will, will it will you'll you'll kill it because uh you can cut a lot faster than it can grow I see. I mean, okay, you, I you can cut if, well it depends how big it is if it's a couple acres you can't no, but if you if you have a 20 by 20 you could it, it may take you seven years to uh, get rid of it uh i've had mine going for four years now and I only had one sprout last year, oh. uh, but uh, yeah, I had bamboo up 20 feet or so. Excuse me, Doctor. Um, you just simply cut it. Some people told me, you know, after you cut it, they pour something, you know. I away. cut it and I, I, I've been pulling too. You speed it up a lot if you pull. Oh, okay. Oh, do you pour something else like to like a... No, just pull. To, uh, oh, okay. It's all connected. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. not easy to pull. Right. It's, definitely it's very, it's yes, it's hard. definitely very tough. <laughs> I, I tried to learn all the way, you know, anything, you know, to get it. Well, anyway, never mind. Okay, yeah. we'll just keep cutting. Okay, okay. yeah. Okay. Someone wants to know where you could buy those little bee house hotel things. Oh, uh, okay. just try online bee houses. That's where I... I yeah, they just didn't know if there was a local place or not. That's where they went. Um, I don't know if I've seen, anybody seen any bee houses anywhere? You can make your own. I've got plenty of bamboo. Actually, you can go to anybody who's growing bamboo and they'll, they'll let you have the bamboo. <laughs> and then you just build it. So people are suggesting Amazon and places like that as well. So someone has a question. Do you suggest that we try to eradicate invasives that we see in parks and roadsides? So if we're driving along and we see something and we know it's invasive, should we, as individuals, do something? Well, theoretically, you could get into trouble. <laughs> if you're, you're not supposed to damage a, any living thing in a park, state park, city park, so forth. That includes the weeds. Now, um, I don't think anything, anybody would say anything if you start pulling them up. Um, probably as you're walking along or something, but uh, theoretically you, you uh, should get permission and uh, uh, Princeton, um, uh, the environmental groups in Princeton have a pulling session. Um, the invasive uh, species uh, uh, task force will have, uh, they will arrange it with the uh, park authorities and so forth. Uh, obviously on your own property or your friend's property, just go ahead and pull. Uh, if I see ragweed or something, sometimes I pull it up, <laughs> even if it's not on my yard. But um, theoretically, uh, you could get in trouble. I don't know if anyone would really uh, prosecute you for the, pulling up ragweed or something. So a follow-up question is, when you're getting rid of these non-native plants, how do you safely dispose of them? Uh, I put them in the compost pile usually. Now, some of the things are aggressive, like lesser celandine. And uh, just putting them on the compost pile, I mean, uh, so you pile them up there, and then the next year they come up anyway. Uh, so what you might want to do, um, that I've been putting them in a pile and then covering them up with plastic. Um, you can cover them up with black plastic. Uh, they don't, you're not really supposed to put them in the garbage either because uh, gar garden waste, um, they don't want you filling up the compo uh, the um, 
uh, garbage dumps with uh, plant material from your garden. So, um, I mean, if you sneak some in, they're not going to say anything. They don't check through your garbage to see if you put anything in there. Um, but you could put them in plastic bags and just let them sit for a little while and the bacteria will take care of them. Yes. Just the non, does the Native Plant Society have a list of nurseries or? Yeah, we have, uh, we have lists of, um, we have a list of approved nurseries and we have, I think there, they put some other nurseries on that, uh, I'm not sure if we've approved of them or not, but uh, they, somebody has approved of them. <laughs> uh, but we have lists of native nurseries um, and sources. Uh, there's Pine Lands uh, Direct. There's, uh, used to be Wild Earth. Um, there's a, uh, what? Toad Shade. Oh, Toad Shade, yeah. Uh, Randy's Toad Shade. Um, what's the other one up north? Uh, uh, Jared's. Um, look, look on our uh, website. We've got them all listed. <laughs> Someone said they saw the bee houses at Lowe's. Oh, really? That might be a Lowe's. Lowe's. Place to oh, okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it's not really a question. It's more of a comment. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of the Native Plant Society website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the question is, what is the status of the Native Plant Society? Are they still active? Are they more involved? Okay. And also sure. to master gardeners because. I think there are multi-part questions. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, send it to a horticulture or, yeah, horticulture, and um, I'll answer them online. Yes, Peter. Uh, thanks, Dr. Link, for the excellent program. I just had a couple of comments that um, rather than this category, the deer will eat all of the ivy, which ivy, you know, they have, there's so many deer, and also uh, the uh, Canadian uh, golden rider. So they, they eat it? There's so many up here, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I have a really bad hair problem, and I have so many of the uh, golden ones. I didn't plan them that. I just uh, didn't do much job with them, and all of a sudden they're, but you will never catch them I'm here in New York. Really? Yeah, it yeah. depends how many deer there are. I mean, there's uh, just, like, just, well, they, they, yeah. Their very aggressive. Mm -hmm. They eat uh, the holly. I can't, I can't believe eating holly and farming deer, you know. <laughs> I can't imagine that. Goats have been successful. I mean, uh, successful. Goats. I can't say who they were using goats. Mm -hmm. they yeah. They do that in Central Park, I think, or uh, New York City. They have, right, right. They have a goat. Uh, yeah, they release goats here and there. <laughs> Excuse me, Dr. Yeah. How about the Hutunia? Is that one invasive petunia? Petunias? Yeah. Uh, there is a native uh, wild petunia. In New Jersey? Yeah, um, it's really a, um, yeah, we grow it. It's kind of cute. Um, I think we grow in my backyard. Uh, Rulia caroliniensis. I have it here. If you want to. Thanks so much. So, I think we should probably finish up. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, oh, this one. Thank, thank you. you all. Yeah, I have a I have a list there. So you will. Yeah. You gotta come up so we'll be Oh, okay. You're gonna. This is a final question. Final statement. All right. <laughs> final statements. Thank you so much for everyone who attended online. We had how many? Two hundred fourteen people. Two hundred and fourteen people online. And we had about a dozen people here uh, inside. So thank you all for coming and listening. I thought it was very informative. I uh, just want to let you know that next month we have Jim Peck returning. He does nature talks and he's going to be talking about the Pine Barrens and what we can do to, you know, ha have recreation there and appreciate all the flora and fauna there. So he's coming on November 8th. Is that correct? November 8th, Wednesday, it November 8th, and it will be a hybrid program as well, like this one, so you can see it online or in person. So we hope to see you again next month, and thank you, Dr. Ling. Uh, thank you very much, Arave Varia, for uh, helping me to organize this. This was very serendipitous. We met at the uh, flower and uh, flower show, I guess it was, flower and plant show at the Davidson Mills Park. And that was how this 
program came about. So I'm very grateful to the Native Plant Society and Dr. Ling for coming out tonight. Thank you all for coming. Please go to our website and sign up, uh, friendsebec.com, and you can join our mailing list. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.